Well, that was certainly funny. I hope what I have to say is not, it's nearly as funny as what's, what that was. Actually, um, I want to first thank Jay um, for helping me through all of all this and preparing for this. And he, he said that uh, when you go on stage, um, it's probably a little bit overwhelming. And, um, and then I said, no, 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 I've been in front of large audiences, don't worry about it and stuff. But then now that I'm here, I have to admit, I am a little bit intimidated by this absolutely beautiful, beautiful venue and, and the audience. Thank you all for coming. Um, and um, today um, we're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about the science in AI and the AI in science. Um, and um, let's first start off with the main question, maybe, that threats through today's um, journey, which is this plot where you see the red line. Now, the red line is the development of human intelligence um, over the years. And um, very optimistically, this line is going upward. I would certainly personally be thinking that recently uh, it would have been more appropriate to bend it downward, but maybe that's not the point. The most important point is that there is another curve, which is the, the curve that starts in 1950, which is the advent of um, artificial intelligence. Um, around that time, Alan Turing and others started to study intelligence in machines. And there's no doubt that intelligence in machines has grown faster than intelligence in humans. And that curve is going upward exponentially. And you see this green dot, which is the crossing point where artificial intelligence is equally capable as human intelligence. And the question we are going to explore today, are we there yet? Um, and so this is the menu for today. There's a bit of a distasteful picture there. But this is from Deep Dream. In fact, if you squint your eyes, you probably recognize the dude that's in that picture. It's a Dutch painter. Um, yeah, overlaid with all sorts of other crap that's coming from this deep learning um, uh, sort of uh, model. Um, but the menu for today, I want to say, is um, actually you already had the main dish. The main dish was this absolutely gorgeous uh, music, uh, uh, this concert that we've heard. So this is kind of your dessert, but I'm going to warn you it's a bit of a heavy dessert. Think of this as a, as a heavy cheesecake. Um, so, um, Jay also warned me that if you're nervous, you're going to go too fast through your slides. Um, and so, but I'm protected, insured against that, so he made me make many more slides, and now I have 60 slides. So, it is going to be a heavy, heavy set of slides. But most of them are light and full of pictures and stuff, so, so don't worry about it too much. Um, and so, in the first part, in the, in the prologue, we'll be talking about um, sort of what has AI achieved recently. Um, and then in the second part, this is science of AI, I'm actually going to um, try to explain to you what AI is, what machine learning is, and how you train these models. And so this is the more sort of, it's not technical, but it's more heavy part. Um, so you go, can go home and you can actually tell everybody that you actually learned something tonight. And then the second part is where I'm going to try to convince you that AI has a beautiful application area in the sciences. And I'm, now I'm talking about the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics. And um, now that part was, once you survive that part, I think uh, you, know, you can relax. Then we're going to talk about AI and art. It's fun and interactive. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end with an epilogue. All right, so on to the prologue then. So I'm just going to show you some, some things that AI has achieved in uh, sort of the last maybe, you know, 10, 5 to 10 years. So AI has gotten very good at generating images. And so these images are generated by a machine called Midjourney or some of these other ones, um, where you ask it with a piece of text to generate for me, let's say, a human kissing a robot. And then it will generate, you know, a couple of images that, that illustrate that particular text prompt. And in the past five years, it's gotten exquisitely good at this, right? So we can, we can um, you know, generate these images with lots and lots of beautiful detail. And of course, these images are not pulled from the internet, just to be sure, right? These are, every time it generates an image, it's an entirely new image. It has gotten so good, in fact, 
that um, it's winning competitions at this point. So here we have two examples. One is a photograph, a fake photograph, it's not a real photograph, generated by an AI system that was submitted to a contest and actually won the photograph competition. And the, and the painting you see there uh, was actually also was a painting generated by AI, not a real painting therefore, a fake painting. It was also uh, submitted to a, a competition and it won, you know, and it, and it says um, artists aren't happy, right? Clearly it's, it's, a, it's a big a bit of a blow that, you know, in your own competition the AI will actually win from you. Now the next stage after images obviously is moving images, videos, right? And here, um, so, so this is basically the current state of the art in that. It's more expensive to train and run. Um, but, you know, it's not bad, right? So there we see a shot following a hiker through a jungle forest, um, and that's what it is input, and it actually generates, you know, a person walking through a jungle. Um, and you see these other ones, they're quite entertaining, a dog licking a sort of an ice cream and stuff. What I want to say is, you know, this is the development in, in, in maybe a few years, maybe even one year, right? And so it's not hard to predict what will happen, right? Pretty soon we'll be able to provide it a script and it will be able to generate an entire movie illustrating that script. And by the way, you can also ask it to write the script at some point, of course. Now this is the part I'm personally much more excited about. And this is where um, we have AI making a big impact in the sciences. So what does this illustrate? This is a, a, a tool that's being developed by Google DeepMind, it's called AlphaFold. Um, and, it, uh, per, and it takes the, as input a sequence of amino acids. These are the building blocks of proteins, and proteins are the things that are in your body and making your body work. It gives you the only the sequence of these amino acids, and it will predict the three-dimensional structure of that protein. It folds it up into three dimensions. And why is that important? Because the three-dimensional structure of a protein determines the function of that protein. And uh, DeepMind has now folded up, I don't know, millions and millions of these proteins and made them publicly available. And this is very, very good for, it, for the um, biologists. So this is uh, our own work. Um, here, uh, we give us input, we generate, we give us input basically a question, generate a molecule for me that binds to this particular, uh, you know, protein or something like that. And then, um, out of thin air, with a random number as input and this, and this question, it will then automatically generate in three dimensions this, this molecule which has these properties. Um, and it's, it's uh, done by a particular algorithm which I will explain more, it's called diffusion-based diffusion modeling. Um, and you can see how this is important for developments of new drugs, for instance, and how pharmaceutical industries could be very interested in, in a tool like this. Again, this is something that has evolved very, very quickly over the past years. And then here is this uh, famous chat GPT. Um, this one was the one that I liked most. Um, it, it's, you know, I don't know if you're into math, but here the question is, um, can you write a proof that there are infinitely many primes with every line that rhymes? Right? A prime a prime number is a number that you cannot divide by anything except for itself and one. Um, and then GPT-4 says, yes, I can, uh, though it might take a clever plan. I'll start with noting Euclid's proof, which shows that primes aren't just aloof. Assume we have a finite list of primes that none have ever missed, have been missed. Multiply them all together and add one just to be clever. The result will be a number that has no prime factors, oh wonder, but every number has a prime that divides it. It's just a matter of time. So we found a contradiction, and our finite list needs eviction. There must be infinitely many primes, and that's the end of my rhyming lines. Now, if you know the proof of infinitely many primes, then this actually follows this proof. It's a proof by contradiction. It's very smart, and it also writes it in rhyme. And so I think this, is, uh, this, this has blown me away. Uh, and then you can ask the question, so this is another advance that you've probably seen in the, um, in the, in the media a lot, which is um, AlphaGo, also uh, from the same family as this AlphaFold. It's a reinforcement learning algorithm. And this is an algorithm that plays the game of Go, where you have to put these white and these black stones on the board. And you probably know the story. Um, it, 
It was uh, played. It has played against the world champion Go Lee Sedol, and it beat the the world champion four to one. Not, not many people actually predicted that that would happen. But you can ask yourself the question: Is AI can it be creative, right? Now, what happened in game two, move 37, it put that black dot there on the screen. And all the human experts said, that is a mistake. That's ridiculous. No, nobody would ever put a, put a stone there. Uh, but it turned out that that was the key move that actually won the game. And so you could argue that is actually, if any human had put the stone there, it would have been a very creative move, right? So. Um, in my definition, that would be definitely some form of creativity. Um, and then you can ask yourself the question, is AA already at the point of being superhuman? Right Now, let's look at these, uh, these, these headlines. Um, it says, AI models like ChatGPT and GPT-4 are acing everything from the bar exam to AP biology. And the other one is GPT-4 beats 90% of lawyers trying to pass the bar. Right? So in these standardized tests, in fact, it can just beat, you know, do these exams and it can do it better than the humans can. So in that particular sense, it's already surpassed human intelligence. Of course, it's also much faster than humans. It also has a much broader knowledge of the world because it knows the entire internet. So it has already some facets in which it's better than humans. But the one that surprised me is the one that's on the right, that says AI has better bedside manner than some doctors to the study finds. And um, so not only can it do better diagnoses when talking to a patient, it actually has better bedside manners in, in explaining to the patients you know, um, what is the problem, what, what, is, what is the diagnosis, and what is the, the treatment plan. That I found very, very surprising. Okay, so that's sort of the introductory part, the prologue, if you wish, where we have talked about what can AI already achieve. And I think it's, it's done amazing things, and this is, of course, only a small fraction of all the things that have really happened over the past, over the past years. Um, now I'll talk about some of the technology behind it, um, and I will also talk about some of the um, sort of names that you'll see um, in, you know, when you read the newspaper, right? The first thing on the bottom is the biggest sort of thing is artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is the art of making machines smart. And this could be in any possible way. It, it could just be you just write down some, some rules, something like, you know, if I'm in front of a red stopping light, I should brake. If I'm in front of a green stopping light, I should hit the gas, right? And actually, modern cars are filled with these types of rules, hundreds of millions of these types of uh, rules that sort of m make your car somewhat smart. Now, it is a very inefficient way of making machines smart. Um, and in fact, a much better way is the way that humans are make, you know, becoming smart, which is by learning, by looking at examples and by learning. So if you look at a child, how it learns, it observes the world, and it does experiments, right? It, it drops things and it figures out how the laws of physics work. And then it takes in this data, and it then trains its internal neural network in order to become better at predicting the world next time. And that is machine learning, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. So machine learning has, there's many models in machine learning, but there's one model in particular which has been extremely successful, which are neural networks. And in principle, the, the deep neural networks, is, the, this field is called deep learning. And on the very you know, left corner, or right corner for you, um, you see actually a deep neural network, which is actually one maybe already 10 years old, where every one of these colors is one layer in that neural network that processes information and represents it to the next layer. So they become very, very large. Now, more recently, the term foundation models you might have seen. In foundation models, we train very large, deep neural networks on a very broad, diverse set of data. It's very raw data. We don't do much to it. We don't annotate it. But it could be images and text and you know, all sorts of other things. We throw in that model, we train it, and it basically learns to represent the world. And once we've trained this massive amount of data unsupervised, 
then in fact uh, you can fine-tune it to particular tasks. And there's one already early example where people trained, for instance, one of these foundation models on images from the web, your, your vacation pictures and your family pictures, and then they took one of these models and they specialized it to predict skin lesions. And they showed that if you start off from this very general neural network, it would do much better. Now, generative AI is a subset of that, where um, it's a little bit like machine learning, but it's um, where you give it an input, and it will typically generate multiple examples of, from, of what you want. So we've seen images, we've seen videos, we've seen molecules. All of these things are examples of generative AI. You generate things by asking it with a text prompt. And then a subset of that is the large language models which generate text, basically. And you know, have, they, f they show a kind of general intelligence called AGI, artificial general intelligence. It's not specialized to do one thing, but they can actually hold a conversation about any topic that you want. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to explain to you how machine learning works. And actually, how amazing it is, if, if, you know, also the way that you have been trained to do things in your brain. So I'm just going to show you this, this thing. And um, I'm pretty sure you've never seen that particular thing before in the real world. But if I ask you what this is, you probably have a pretty good sense of what it is, right? And how is this possible? You've never seen it before. It looks actually quite weird, its shape, but still you can see what this is. No, I hope everybody saw that that was a chair, because you can sit in it. But believe me or not, there are people who cannot do that. Um, and it, it's actually an issue um, in the sense that, you know, every time they see something new that ha they haven't seen before, they have to completely learn this from scratch. Um, and so that means you can't basically generalize. You can think in abstractions and concepts, and you can't generalize. So what are we doing when we are actually recognizing this thing. What we're doing is we are basically sifting away 99% of all the irrelevant information. The fact that it was red is not important. The fact that it had a funny, has a funny base is not important, right? Most of this stuff is not important for you to recognize that this is a chair. So what you do is you throw away most of the information, you keep the essence. And so what's interesting, so that's important for generalization, compression. And so the interesting thing, counterintuitive thing, is that to know is really to forget. Not everything, but most of it. And so this is how that works, right? So you start with some kind of raw ore, which are your images. You, you sieve them into essential information, which is the gold, and in noise which is the stuff you're not really interested in, because it doesn't help you generalize. In fact, it's, it, it, it avoids you to generalize, so you really should get rid of it. And so, this information that's coming, this useful information, that we will transfer into the parameters of one of these neural networks, right? So there's a neural network there, at the right bottom, uh, left bottom corner there, and this useful information is going to be transferred into the parameters of this neural network. And with that, you can make predictions into the future. So what is a neural network, you'll ask? So let's dig a little bit into what neural networks are. So here's a neural network. So a neural network was actually already invented right at the beginning of, um, you know, of, of, of artificial intelligence in the, in the in 1940s. Um, and it's an architecture that's inspired by the brain. So you see a bit of brain there at the, at the top corner, top right corner, which is neurons. You know, every neuron is something that can spike, can be on or off. And neurons are connected with, you know, synapses, which is basically a channel that transfers information from one neuron to the next neuron. And sort of that, an abstraction of that is really what a neural network is. And so here you see how it operates. You have an image, a seven. A seven, an image of a seven consists of a whole bunch of pixels. In this case, it's black and white. So you have black pixels and white pixels. And you put those one by one on the first layer of the neuron. So the first pixel in the left upper corner of the image, you stick in the first neuron and the next one in the second neuron, etc. 
So that's the input to the neural network. And then this information gets processed by these synapses. This information goes from left to right, it gets processed, and in the middle, sort of more abstract representations are emerging. You like maybe corner, this is a corner, or this is an edge, right? or this is a part of a seven, or something like that. And at the very end, you have the final abstraction, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. Right? So, so those are the abstractions of the categories of which you actually want to predict. Um, and um, so how do you then train, right? Because, you know, okay, we have these synapses and we have this architecture, but now how do you now train these parameters which are in this neural network, right? So we're now in the thick of sort of the more technical part. So if you can hold on here, um, that's great. So this is where you can really learn how a neural network works and how it's being trained. So imagine you're a car fanatic and you want to train a classifier that uh, distinguishes images of Ferraris from images of Kias. Super impor important task, of course. And so you will first do some measurements called features on your car. So maybe the length and the width and, this and the weight, three numbers. Um, and you have a whole bunch of examples of cars and you would put them all you know, in your database, which are this kind of these red and blue dots there. Of course, you don't know the color yet typically, or when you're training set, you know the color. Um, and then, okay, so then you put your, your first example on the input of your neural network. It's untrained, right? And it goes through these sequence of transformations and it predicts Ferrari, so that's wrong. So now what you do is you go back to these parameters here and now you have to, these are all knobs, and now you have to turn these knobs so that next time when you push the example through the input, it will actually say the right thing. Now, how do you do that? It's that, that algorithm you know, is basically, it's called backpropagation. It's a, basically a gradient descent algorithm. You have to compute gradients, it doesn't matter. Um, but that's basically how you repeat. You repeat this particular process, which is try a new example, see if it does well. If it doesn't do well, if it makes a mistake, turn some knob so that next time it does better. And I would actually argue this is how we also learn, right? I mean, if I, I mean, if you know this example, if you know, I go to the uh, refrigerator and I pick up this milk carton, right? I pick it up and then I do like this. And the reason I do like that is I expect this thing to be full of milk, but in fact it was empty. And so my motor commands were wrong and I do this. So now I have the wrong prediction, I make a mistake. And that is a learning signal for me. That tells me, okay, I need to do something in my brain to next time around, I need to change that, right? So I believe we constantly predict the future, and every time we do it right, you know, that's fine, don't change anything. If it's wrong, then you should really change something. Okay, after you've repeated that many times, you then have an actual classifier for any new test image, you will, you will then know if it's a Kia or, or a Ferrari. Okay, so how is that different Right, so from sort of building an artificial intelligence system with rules. And the way that this is different is that, you know, in one case you're coding up the software, you're writing rules like if this, then do that, if this, then do that. Right, and in the second way, it's basically much more like a human being, like a, like a, like a kid learns. And in some sense, you're, you're programming at the meta level. You're programming an algorithm to program itself. Right? That's what a learning algorithm is. And the program is a neural network, and the, the other program is a learning algorithm that, that understands how to change that neural network to learn about and to better predict the world. Okay, so that was maybe abstract. I don't know where you're coming from, but if that was abstract, now we're going to go through a few examples so that you can get a sense of what these neural networks are, right? So the first, neuro, the first example, it's always of the kind, there's some input, then there is some process by your neural network, the information gets processed, and then there is a prediction on the other end. Okay, so the input, for instance, in this case, could be an input photo, right? An, an image, so you have self-driving car, self-driving car has a camera, the camera makes pictures, right? And the output in this case is the sort of the, for every pixel in the image, it says to what object does it belong, right? So it could be air, it could be street, it could be tree, it could be anything. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's one example, photo in, sort of classification out. 
Here is one that says, piece of text in, picture of Meta Frederiksen with a hat and sunglasses. And this is generated by one of these image generators. And it gives this particular pixel as output. You can judge whether that looks alike or not. Um, so here the example is text in, image out. Now let's, let's go a little bit into this generative AI because that's really some of these things that, that are really state of the art. So this, these algorithms, these, these, um, these algorithms which generate these images are based on the following principle. It's actually a quite simple principle. It's based on a physics analogy which is called diffusion. Diffusion is if you take your cup of coffee and you drop some milk in it, then the milk will disperse slowly through the cup of coffee. So here what we do is we take an input image and we slowly add noise to the input image, step by step, many steps. And at the end of that process, we have a completely noisy image. But now, in that process, we have generated for ourselves a learning signal, because we can take an arbitrary one of these noised cats, and we know that we want to map that back to the clean cat. So we want a neural network that takes a noisy cat and denoises it into a clean cat. So that's the neural network that we're training. Now once we've done that, we can then take a completely noisy image, which is the one on the left hand side here on the bottom, and just run it, and it will project it onto a reasonable image that we humans like. Right? So it's learned to produce images from a particular distribution um, that you know, it's being trained on. Okay, so that's called diffusion-based models. If you, if you read about that in the literature, this is the state of the art. Um, and here is an example of um, some a slightly older version of this already, um, because the, the space of faces, of human faces, is actually much smaller than the space of all possible images. Um, and there's this website, which is called thispersondoesnotexist.com, which is basically an infinite number of Im, you know, images of faces. You can just generate arbitrary faces by this image generator. Of course, you can use that for, uh, you know, for advertisement campaigns or something like that. And I'm going to show you a little video, which is already a little bit older, uh, from NVIDIA, which was one of the first companies that managed to sort of generate these beautiful face images. And you can just see it. It's kind of nice, because as it starts to generate a, a face, you can see it is, it's, it's really trying to figure out, you know, should I make it a male, or should I make it a female, or should I make it a somewhat older, or should I make it a younger individual, right? And you can sort of see it, sort of um, try to decide that. So it starts with something that's very noisy, and then it's trying to fill in details, as I just explained, right? And you can just see it, this, this person in the middle, sometimes it's a male, sometimes it's a female, and sometimes it's a bit older, and sometimes it's a bit younger. Right? So that's how that works. Um, and then here, actually, um, so this is the final one, which is uh, text in, text out. And here I asked, this to chat GPT, I asked, uh, can you crack a joke about Denmark? Let's see what it says. It says, why did the bicycle go on vacation to Denmark? Because it heard the Danish people were so really friendly. Well, it makes you laugh, so it's not too bad. <laughs> and I also think this actually, you know, it actually thought up this joke. It probably doesn't exist, this joke. It just really thought up this joke, which I think is also kind of interesting. There's even algorithms out there that can explain a joke to you. So you, you get a joke, and you look at it, and you think, oh, why is this funny? And then uh, you actually ask this neural network to explain the joke to me, and it understands the joke, and this explains why this is funny. It really exists. Okay, so what is these large language models? I just want to give you a little sense of what, how they are trained. After this, it's all easier, I, I promise. But this is the one thing that is maybe a little, little bit technical. But you know, if, if, you can, if you can get it, because it's one of the most important uh, models out there right now. Um, it's, it's called a transformer model for large language models. So how is it trained? It's really trained in a very simple way. So you give it a whole bunch of sentences. I'm talking trillions of sentences. And 
you just leave out random words from that sentence. And then you ask it to fill in the words that you've left out. A particular instance of this is to, to predict the next word, and then the next word, and then the next word, right? It's again future prediction. And some people call it therefore a statistical parrot. It's just trying to predict the next word. For me, the amazing part about these language models is how come these things actually become intelligent, right? How come you can actually have a meaningful conversation with a chatbot if the only thing that it's being trained on is this? I, fi I find that amazing. So uh, somehow, out of all of that complexity, the simplicity of the learning rule, but the complexity of the model, comes a truly intelligent machine. There's a second thing that OpenAI does, which is called RL, or reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is basically that it's asking humans to rate certain responses. So it's generating three or four things, and then it's asking, okay, which one did you like most? And that particular piece of feedback goes back into the algorithm, so that next time it picks, it, it picks better answers to give to humans. And then this model, which is called a transformer model, which is sort of the state of the art in all of these AI models, which what's called self-attention or multi-head attention. And really what that is, is if I have a sentence, right? sometimes in a sentence there's very long-term relationships, because you sometimes break a, a verb into two. I'm not sure if this is in Danish too, but in Dutch, you, you take a verb, you break it in two, and you start you know, with the verb in one end, and you have a whole blah, 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 and then the second part of the verb ends up somewhere else in the sentence. Right? So what you do in this attention is like you go to this particular word and then you look for all the other words in the sentence that are relevant for this particular word. And so you're attending to other words in the sentence and it learns what to attend to. And that's this self, this is the attention module. Okay, there's a lot more of course, but you know, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, then there is a second, I've, I've dropped the term already a little bit, which is reinforcement learning. Um, so in reinforcement learning, um, the input is a sequence of observations, right? Just think about a mouse, let's say that's in a, in a maze, and it's trying to get to the cheese. The observations that it's seeing is um, basically the, uh, the, the walls of the maze, right? And, the, uh, and, the, the, and then it has to make a whole sequence of decisions to get to the goal, which is the cheese. And this is like, do I go left or do I go right or do I go straight? Right? So that's what the reinforcement learning is, a sequence of decisions that it has to make. And um, of course, what is special about living beings, and the question is, can, can artificial intelligence ever reach that goal, is this mouse was really thinking out of the box. It solved the problem in its own way. Okay, so here's a, a bunch of examples from, for reinforcement learning. This is also a really important algorithm. I said it's, it's, it underlies this, this alpha fold, but it also underlies alpha go, which is this game to, uh, to, to put these stones on the board. This was a reinforcement learning algorithm. And the input is the sequence of stones that you put on the board, and the output is the decisions, where do I put my next stone? So you see, you need to see a sequence of decisions to make. And of course, there's an ultimate goal, which is winning the game. And we all know where that ended. You know, it was basically four to one for the, for the, for the, for the AI when it played the, uh, the world champion Lisa Dole. Now, another one that, you know, application of this, and there's, there's many, many of those, which is keeping a plasma steady inside a nuclear fusion reactor. So if you make one of these reactors and you put a plasma inside, it will get very, very hot, like 100 million degrees Celsius, hotter than the sun, actually. And the plasma cannot hit the boundary of the fusion reactor because it will melt. And so to keep it inside, they have magnetic fields to keep this thing inside of this, uh, this fusion reactor. And so the input is the observations about the state of the plasma, and the output is a sequence of decisions, which is what voltage should I apply to my magnets in order to keep this plasma inside, stable inside this particular fusion reactor. Okay, so now, now I'm going to talk to you about a very, very serious application of reinforcement learning algorithm. And that is the problem that humanity has always wanted to solve. It is the all-important problem of flipping a pancake. So let me show here how that works. So here is somebody who is showing how to flip a pancake to the robot.
That's how you do it. Now try yourself. First trial. Yeah. And after 20 trials, you would think it's improved, but no. <laughs> but then, they did something smart, and now it flips pancakes. Solved. Now, what's interesting about this is that you only have to solve this once. Maybe some dude in Australia does this and figures this out. And from there on, every robot arm in the world can flip pancakes because you just have to you know, transfer the weights from the, you know, your parameters from one machine to the other machine. And that's in stark contrast to humans. If you can flip a pancake, you have to teach me and I have to start over again, right? I have to st start this whole process over again. You cannot just transfer your information into my brain and then I'm done. So in that sense, really robots are quite different from human beings. So then, what is underlying all that, right? What is the technology that's underlying that? And why are we seeing this, this step change in artificial intelligence? So there's three factors that go into that. The first factor is Moore's Law. So now Moore's Law, I hope, I hope you've, you know about that, but I hope Moore's Law is already from the 60s, and it's the, basically that the compute power doubles every you know, one and a half, two years or so. And it's already going on for a long time. So the most, the most important chips right now for machine learning are these GPUs. It's basically a monopoly by NVIDIA has figured out how to make them for deep learning. The latest version is an H100, and they're very, very expensive. And you need, if you were very serious about this, like Google or Microsoft, you need 10,000 of them to build, these, to build these really, really big models. Okay, so the next, and, and that's kind of, that's an exponential growth curve, right? And this, the next exponential growth curve is big data. This came a little later, but at some point we were collecting more and more data. I think we are in the zettabytes right now that we are, have been collecting and we've been storing. And we are using that data to feed into our models, right? So if, if you can think of Moore's law as the engine, you know, you can think of big data as the gas that goes into the car. And then the compute and the data feed into these neural networks, right? And these neural networks have, have become in, insanely large, I would say, right? So the models right now, the number of parameters that are freely adjustable parameters is in the trillions. So we are reaching a trillion free parameters. Now, when I started in this field, I'm, I'm, I'm old, but not that old. When I started, we were talking about 100. You know, we were quite happy when we were dealing with 100 parameters, right? Here we're talking about a trillion parameters. And so just to give you a sense, the number of free parameters in your, in your brain, the number of synapses between neurons, is estimated to be around 100 trillion. So that's only a factor 100 away. And in an exponential growing world, that might just mean maybe 10 years, five years, or something like that before we're there. So then we can train models that have the same number of parameters as human brains, but of course, the switches and the things in a computer are far, far faster than we can put in a human brain, right? The human brains are very slow compared to these, to these models. Right? And so the, this, this deep learning, you can think of as the, as, the, as the smarts of the car. Okay, so we have really entered a new paradigm in my field. When I started, it was all about modeling. Now, it's about scaling. The paradigm is bigger is better, right? Make your model bigger, not smarter. Um, and you know the costs to train these very large models are very high. You know they go, you know the estimates go between 10 and 100 million per model that you need to train. And then the question is, if these costs are so high, can Europe compete? Can a country like Denmark can compete, or can even Europe compete with in China and the U.S.? I think that's a really interesting question to add, to answer. Okay, so that was the part where, we, where I talked about AI, and I was talking about the science of AI. So you've made it through that part, that's great. Now we're gonna talk about what can AI do for science, right? And science is an absolutely wonderful, beautiful field. 
And it's also amazing because it spans an insane amount of spatial temporal scales, right? If you do particle physics, you think about picometers or femtoseconds. When you go all the way up to galaxies and astronomy, you talk about light years, right, and giga years. Now, in the middle, there's all sorts of other stuff. And what's interesting is that all of these scales are described by a somewhat limited set of tools typical partial differential equations, or ordinary differential equations, or stochastic differential equations. Because the world is continuous, the world is causal, um, and the world is local. Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you that we are at the verge of a new paradigm in scientific discovery using AI. And for that, I'm first going to say how people innovate over, you know, how, how people make new things, try, you, know, in, you know, maybe engineer new things. So the first thing people do is they build something. They were in the old days, people built something like a plane, and then you try it, you fly it, right? If it crashes and you survive, yeah, you try something else, you improve a little bit, and you keep on going. Now later, people you know, designed these planes and then put them in a wind tunnel, and then they would collect lots and lots of data about, you know, how this plane would perform in the real world. And then based on that data, they would redesign a better plane. So these days, planes are put in virtual wind tunnels, so that you don't actually have to put them in a real wind tunnel. You can put them in a virtual wind tunnel, which simulates the actual wind through Navier-Stokes equations. And in doing so, you would need increasingly more compute power. And something very similar happens in the molecular sciences. If you want to come up with a new molecule, you want to design a new molecule or new material, in the old days, people just tried a lot of things and see what stuck. Right? Then people started to do lots of experiments, design things and start to do lots of experiments, and from those experiments, would collect data sets, and from those data sets, they would do new, new designs. But nowadays, they do everything in silico. I mean, a large part of the simulations of the actual molecules, the way these molecules move around, are actually also simulated into a, in a computer. And again, you need a lot of compute, but we have an increasing amount of compute. So that is sort of the, the evolution of, you know, how people do science. But the new paradigm is that machine learning is going to play an important role in this. And again, um, I'm assuming you are a car fanatic. So um, we have here an old Mercedes. And this is the first Mercedes uh, you're going to put in the wind tunnel. Because you're going to test it. And you find basically all sorts of measurements from that wind tunnel. And the, the wind tunnel could be a virtual wind tunnel in this case. Now when the next Mercedes comes that you have designed, you can go through the same process. You can put it again in the wind tunnel, it's very expensive, and you, would, you could see how, how well it works. But the new paradigm says, well, why don't you, for, when you did the first experiment, why don't you actually store the data in a big database, then train a neural network that can predict the outcome of the experiment, or can actually do the simulation for you a lot faster, so that next time you don't have to do the actual expensive experiment. And that is the new paradigm for uh, scientific discovery that we see is starting to emerge. And the first example where this is happening is in weather prediction. So I've witnessed over the past two years or so how this has changed the field. So these, these papers are a little older. Um, our punk weather is maybe, you know, maybe one year old, which is the, which is the paper on, that, on the right-hand side for you. So these are neural networks that predict the state of the weather in the future, but they do it 10,000 times faster than the actual numerical simulators. Right? And when this first came out, all the meteorologists were extremely cautious. Skeptic, I would say. They said, this is not going to overturn, you know, decades of research in meteorology and all these smart solvers that we have developed in this field. But now, this has turned into a, a slight panic, that if we don't catch up with this particular technology, we might actually uh, make ourselves uh, somewhat superfluous. And, um, and so, yeah, these, these models are now shown to have almost or the same accuracy as the numerical weather predictions that, that meteorologists use, but they can do so 10,000 times faster. And of course, 
when you are designing wind turbines or something like that, and you, you want to understand where wind turbines should be placed um, in, uh, in, in the sea, it's very useful if you can simulate you know, the weather very, very fast. But there's many more examples where this is happening. Um, and so here's a bunch of beautiful illustrations. So on the left upper corner, these, these green blobs, those are electron clouds as they sort of fluctuate and evolve around the molecule, around the atoms. And it's very, very expensive to solve the Schrodinger equation. Um, and so machine learning models have now been used in order to solve this uh, Schrodinger equation much, much faster. In the middle, you see the actual atoms themselves move around. And in order to compute, to, to compute where an atom is moving, you need to compute the force that's acting on that atom. And that's, again, a very expensive computation that should also involve quantum mechanics. But now machine learners have trained these force fields. Again, it's a neural network that predicts these forces and then with very high accuracy, and then they can simulate these. On the right-hand side, you can see the weather. This is basically pressure fields which are fluctuating and turning into uh, wind velocities. And that's the Navier-Stokes equation. And for all of these, we have now machine learning models. And the applications are really very nice, right? So um, on, the, on the left bottom corner, the application is drug discovery, where um, we're trying to fit a particular molecule in the pocket of a, of a protein. That's the drug. We can generate that. In the middle, we see catalysis, which is a surface where chemical reactions are accelerating, for instance, for, for generating hydrogen. And on the right-hand side, we see the design of new materials, for instance, a material that could capture air out of, uh, sort of carbon out of the air, uh, which is a, an MOF structure. Uh, we can design them now much, much faster using machine learning algorithms. And this picture I already showed, um, which is this generation of a molecule from a generative AI. The process that we use is exactly the same as the way that we generate images. It's the same model with a bit of symmetries involved, you know, added into it. Um, but it, it can be used to generate molecules with certain properties. Drug design, as I already said, so this is a particular paper that we wrote where you give the pocket of a protein and you, go, you give some fragments of the molecule as well. So you say, well, this particular fragment would fit nicely here, this particular would fit nicely here. And then the algorithm is asked to complete the molecule in a way that's actually a drug-like molecule so that it could function as an actual drug. Okay, so those are a bunch of examples. Um, and sort of this is my final slide on, on science, on how AI can do for science. I'm very, very excited about this particular area. And the reason is that I think the materials really define humanity, right? We have we actually we have named the ages of humanity after our materials, right? We, we have the Bronze Age, you have the Iron Age, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, and we are at a point where, you know, the sciences themselves, the condensed matter physics and computational chemistry and molecular biology have advanced to a very sophisticated level. And then we have the computational sciences, like, you know, the actual science of computing on a supercomputer, machine learning, as I've argued, but also quantum computing in the future. One of the first applications of quantum computing is in actual chemistry. These together, with the application areas, which are becoming increasingly important, health, the design of new drugs, such as new uh, vaccines, new drugs against, let's say, cancer, or perhaps new uh, antibiotics that can deal with resistant bacteria. For the energy transition, which is, uh, you know, trying to, for instance, split um, water into hydrogen and oxygen, so to build a hydrogen economy. Um, we need new catalysts. And for sustainability, maybe we want biodegradable plastics, right? Or maybe we want uh, new ways to capture carbon out of the air with new materials. So all of these make me think that we might be at a point where I can ask a system to generate a particular material with certain properties for me, and it will generate a list of candidates which I can then use to, you know, do these things. And these could be very funky materials, of course. Okay, so 
that was perhaps the sort of heavy part. Um, the last part, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI in art. So now you can sort of relax a little bit, you know, wake up for those people who got, got a little um, sleepy. Um, so this part is also a little bit more interactive. Um, and, um, and so what can, what can AI do with art, right? So I, I just want to show you this first image, which, was, which is called the next Rembrandt. So this was an actual um, sort of you know, AI algorithm which studied all the Rembrandts and, decide, and sort of predicted what the next Rembrandt would look like. So here it is. Of course, you know, of course you could argue, you know, the actual Rembrandts were nicer, but anyway. I, I also mentioned this, which is this uh, sort of AI generated painting uh, which won this competition. And then maybe the, the final, you know, painting part that I want to show here is this one. So this is uh, out of uh, Matthias Bethke's lab. Um, so you see the, the image there in the left upper corner. This is Tübingen. Um, and you see a number of these paintings there in the left lower corner. They have obviously a particular style. And what happened is that they transferred the style from that painting onto the picture, right? So now you have your photo, but then in the style, you know, of that particular painter. And you will show, you, show them in big, and then maybe the participatory part here is you try to figure out who was the painter. Or you get to think a little bit. I'm sure this first one, I think most of you will get. Okay, that was Van Gogh. Very good. I'm sure you had it. The second one. Yeah, I'm hearing it. Picasso, very good. If you know it, why don't you scream it out, actually? I can't see you anyway. Nobody can see you, so it's, it's nice and anonymous. Sorry? Munk, very good. Yeah, there we go. You can actually see the screaming little man there on the left a little bit still in, you know, it's still stuck a little bit in this, into this thing. It's squeezed, though. This one is a little harder. Sorry? I don't think. But nobody can see you, so it doesn't matter. Anybody else wants to give this a try? Sorry? No. Oh, okay, I'll, 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 you know, it's Turner. And then this one. Yes, very good. Excellent, Kandinsky. Nice. Okay, so let's see how many minutes we still have. Okay, we have, we have some time. So uh, this is about the Turing test. So in around 1950, uh, Alan Turing entered this field, and he already foresaw that it was going to be very difficult to figure out when we have reached sort of true artificial general intelligence. When is a machine truly intelligent? It, it's sort of a moving goalpost, if you want. But he designed a test, and the test is that um, you get to sit, or a bunch of people get to sit in a room and interact through, through a chat bot with either a chat bot or with a human. And um, you need to figure out whether it's the chat bot or whether it's the human. Right? That's called the Turing test. You've got 30 minutes, basically, to do that. Right? And, and um, I'll, I'll do with you an actual Turing test. So the Turing test is... I'm going to show you two paintings, and, um, and I'm going to try to stand here so I can actually can see how many people raised their hand. So we're going to show you two paintings, and you need to choose which one of the two is made by a human and which one is made by an AI, right? And you need to be honest, and the other part of the rule is you have to raise your hand for one of the two. You cannot not raise your hand, so you have to pick one of them. Neutral, I don't know, doesn't exist in this game. Okay, so who of you believes that the boat there is generated by an AI, right? And, and I can guarantee you that if you choose that's an AI, then the other one is a human, or if you choose a human, then the other one is an AI. Right, so now I'm going to ask the boat. Is the boat AI? Yes or no? If you think, yes, the boat is AI, please raise your hand. Okay, and so now I'm going to ask the reverse, and that's everybody else. So who does not think? Okay, so most people clearly think that um, the AI generated the, the female. And that's correct. So you, pa so you, you, didn't, you didn't pass the Turing test. So the Turing passed 
test wasn't passed. Okay, that's good. So we are we still okay. We still okay. Um, next one. Who thinks that the baseball player is generated by an AI? I'll give you a little bit of time. All right, that's most people actually. Who thinks that the that the that the woman is generated by AI? All right. I I would think that's less people, but it's a little hard to count here. But I think it's less people. All right, the woman was generated by AI. So actually, here I think we passed the Turing test. Most people thought that the baseball player was generated by AI. Of course, it was designed to I want to fool you a little bit, but anyway. Okay, we're now going to do. <coughs> The poetic Turing test, which is one of the things I'm going to read to you is written by Shakespeare, and the other one is written by an LSTM, which is some kind of neural network. Okay, the first says, thou art a very earth. Mine eyes smell onions. <laughs> All right, who thinks thou art a very earth is Shakespeare? Again, raise hands. Yeah. Who thinks mine eyes smell onions? Oh, this is about 50-50. Okay, so we passed the Turing test, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Shakespeare is a strange guy. I know. Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> Dost thou thirst base Trojan to have me fold up Parsa's fatal web? Or, if my true amen is full of gold, I shall be periled. Who thinks the first sentence, dost thou first base Trojan, is a AI? And who thinks the other one is AI? Oh, okay, that's really hard to count. I think it's really again 50 50. All right. All right, last one. If manhood, good manhood, be not forgotten upon the face of the earth, then I am a shotten herring. Versus, by Romeo, I will strike without state. All right. Shakespeare, if manhood, good manhood. Oh, sorry, I should say AI. Sorry, oh, that's very confusing. AI, if manhood, good manhood. Quite few, actually. Um, by Romeo, will strike without state. That must be all of you. Okay. Ha ha. Gotcha. All right. Um, so let's see. Let, let's just finish, actually, because I think we're going over time slowly. So let's talk a little bit about um, the uh, opportunities and dangers. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that I do believe artificial intelligence is a game changer, right? It is not an actual statistical parrot, as, many, as some people actually uh, say it is. Um, now, in AI, there's huge opportunities in terms of safety and health and environment and leisure, you, 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 you figure it out. But there's also many dangers, right? Discrimination, surveillance, privacy, you name it. If I would pick one which is perhaps the worst danger, it would be the deep fakes, the deep fake and the sort of um, fake news um, that would, I think, you know, is this uh, sort of misinformation which would really confuse people and I think it's very important for people to be well informed, to have a well functioning democracy. And I would say, if we take that too far and we don't find ways to figure out what's real and what's not, this might actually undermine democracy. Of course, fakes are also great for fun, as you can see there. And this is actually an image of Einstein that didn't used to move, but they brought it to life, you know, with AI. It's kind of nice. So then, and then, you know, the question is all in your mind is AI going to take your job? And if you, take, if you read the newspapers, for sure, you know, there's a lot of danger. You know, AI and robots threaten to unleash mass unemployment. Or will AI take your job? 27% of jobs in wealthy countries are at high risk. 27%. You know, 300 million jobs are, could be replaced, etc. And I think there is some truth to this. I think there's many jobs which we will see change over the next 10 years. It's not happening instantaneously because companies need to figure out how to use this AI and how to integrate it. But as this process happens over the next 10 years, I think there will be a lot of jobs which will be very much transformed. Um, and some jobs, let's be honest about it, 
uh, will actually just go away. I don't think that means there's more unemployment. I think we'll find, we will find new jobs, we'll define new jobs, but what it does mean is that we have to reschool people from one job into another job. And some people might be left behind in that process. And it's, of course, to politics to figure out that those people who are left behind are being taken, well, being taken care of. Now, how close are we to AGI? Coming back to the, to the first slide. Um, well, there's one scientist that says 2031 that the singularity happens, which is basically this runaway event that machines get so smart that they, um, that they uh, sort of explode in our faces in some sense. Ray Kurzweil puts it at 2045, this event. This particular guy, 2023, I don't believe that very much. Honestly, is that it's really impossible to predict. It's really hard to predict what's going to happen, and I don't want to really, you know, do that. Um, what I do know is that dangers are often in corners where you don't expect them, right? So I, would, I think it's more, more important to make sure we are agile and can respond quickly to upcoming new dangers. Um, and we need to make sure that AI gets aligned with human values and we regulate the misuses. And of course, technology develops much, much faster than um, law, and so we really have to make sure that that development goes, goes faster. Um, the you know, new, new legislation, I mean. You would also ask if there's fundamental limits to this progress, and I think there's probably economic limits in the sense that it becomes so ridiculously expensive to train these models that even for big tech companies, it becomes not profitable anymore and they will stop investment. That might be the most important reason why they won't, you know, why it might actually level off at some point. So to conclude, um, AI is a system technology and it will change the world permanently. This, of this I'm pretty sure. And as with any new technology, there's dangers and opportunities, and we need to embrace the opportunities, but make sure that we, um, we curb and you know, we uh, contain the challenges. Um, at this point, I would say humans are a bigger threat to humans than AI. And especially AI in the hands of humans is perhaps even a bigger threat. But runaway rogue AI, I'm, I'm, I'm personally less worried about. I'm much more worried about humans in some sense. Um, on the flip side, I would say AI can also play a very positive role in our society. It can help avert disasters which are coming at us right now. There's no uncertainty about that, such as climate change. And I think AI can play a huge role in you know, helping curb climate change. So in the end, AI is just another really powerful tool, a hammer. And it's up to us, humans, how to use it. Thank you very much.